Well, what I'm saying here is to build on the previous record. Comment in particular at the end of it. I think I, well, it's the end of it at the minute anyway. And that is that I'm trying to preserve the historicity of how I got somewhere, plus the updating by comments. I don't want to change the historicity because I want to illustrate to you, or to show to you, or to reveal where my current view is always coming from historically. It builds on the past. If we obliterate the past, we're in some sense at a loose end. We, we're not anchored to, well, where did these ideas develop from? So, I've tried also, and I've succeeded, I think, so far, in not excluding whole recordings that you might think are just irrelevant. Um, I might add a, a something in the title that makes me think this recording is now not relevant, and in a sense I'd rather it didn't exist. But I don't want to obliterate it because it does exist. And very often it shows, very obviously, something about my, if you like, personal life, which is not irrelevant because that's, far from being irrelevant, it's, it's the context in which at least the original recording, subsequent and, and, and just prior to such recording, are conceived in. You know, I'm not some uh, simplistic voice of God speaking from out of the void, you know. Obviously, I'm the same as anyone else, an ordinary person that's um, learning to live. You know, we're all students. <laughs> None of us are spectacular. Well, we might be very good lecturers, but, you know, we're not God, are we? We don't want to be worshipped as God either. Um, I hope to goodness that what I do is a help. But, um... Hmm... I don't want to be worshipped, do I? Or if I am, it's only as a step into something much more important, which is to worship God, of course. I mean, by definition, isn't it? Um, who wants to hear it second-hand when you can hear it straight from God? You need to be taught of the Holy Spirit. And that's what um, this, the Gospel story um, tells us pretty explicitly. You know, I shall leave another comforter with you. It's the Holy Spirit, and he'll teach you all things, and bring all things to remembrance that I've said to you. Um, he speak only of himself. I mean, not to mention have all sorts of powers and so on as a consequence. Now, so I've even tried to leave in some of the um, talks that I've attended, which are not me talking at all. It gives you an idea of the sort of world in which I'm coming from. And by world, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning the spiritual content of my life at the time when I'm recording. What's happening to me as a person, um, which may not be at all impressive, um, or you may think. Oh, no wonder he's got such mixed up ideas having association with that group or this group or those ideas or that sort of fanaticism or... Well, fair enough. You might be right. But it is for you to decide. Not me, by me hiding 
who I am, the speaker, as if I'm some wonderful mouthpiece of God, purely and simply. We are in some sense a mouthpiece of God, but my goodness, do we colour what we're saying? <laughs> yes. Mm. Message can get a bit mangled, can't it? According to who we are. And that's the reality of it, isn't it? Not to worship this person as the great saint, the great girl. Maybe a saint. Maybe uh, full of wisdom. But let's have a look at it. Let's be open about this. Where was he coming from? And you know, we find in the, in the New, New Testament that slavery is still not something that's, well, it's, it's hinted, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad thing, you know. He that committed sin is a slave to sin. I mean, the servant of, you know, um, it's not looked upon with too much affection, is it? But it's not actively preached against. Um, and if we go back to the Old Testament, war is not actively preached against. On the contrary, it's initiated by God, apparently. And we think, hmm, don't think much of that. And then we find genocide is, you know, something suggested by God. We think, hmm, that's a problem. Well, it can't be genocide. He must be right in some sense. And it's much simpler to say, well, Looks like their view of God has been greatly coloured by who they are. Who were they? Well, we've hidden that by rewriting the history. We've said they're this people that, you know, um, went down into uh, Egypt, lived there 400 years, spent 40 years in the desert with, I mean, we've added the spiritual overtones and turned them into a historicity which is highly likely not to be terribly valid and certainly is not substantiated by other sources of literature other than the book itself. <laughs> well, Pilgrim's Progress is um, legitimized by the book itself. It tells us everything Christian did in the story from his fleeing the city of destruction to finding the celestial city. And it's all in black and white as historicity. But it's not true. It's not a reality. It's a spiritual reality, which is far more important. And Pilgrim's Progress as a book is, is pretty, pretty enlightening, pretty wonderful in that way. But you read it knowing it's not historicity. And because of that, you treat it with some measure of, I'm reading fiction. And that detracts awfully from the truth that this, the story is delivering to you. So, I'm trying to abide by a principle here of sticking to the true history, what happened, who I am, what I said, without cancelling half a line but adding comments, and the Bible does this. It goes through a long historicity of our understanding of God, how it developed, or at least the Hebrew, but Judaic version, possibly just the Judaic version of how it developed. And then we have an upgrade, quite honestly, and that's Jesus. And if Jesus isn't an upgrade, what's the necessary point in him coming? Where is the necessity of him coming? Well, we hold that, of course. Jesus is the very epitome of guidance. We well, hold that if you're Christian. Well, you'd think you would. <laughs> but in fact, so many Christians people that own the name of Christian very earnestly actually don't give preeminence to what Jesus said. The bulk of them seem to give preeminence to what Paul said 
or at least the bulk of the non-conformist church does, perhaps the bulk of the Catholic church gives preference to. Now I think it's still what Paul says because, well what the letters say anyway, because like the pastoral letters very much set up, or can be seen to set up, the Catholic church. Hmm. Whatever. I'll try to leave in something that indicates the world from which I'm coming from, which may seem very strange, even in a few years' time. It needs comment. And in a hundred years' time, well, very strange. And in a thousand years' time, well, there'd be probably something much better to read. <laughs> Other than there might not be. I mean, things like um, the, the Old Testament have lasted quite a long time, and uh, the Buddhist scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita. Do I think my recordings will last that long? Well, you might say it's presumptuous to suppose that, but it's not an unacceptable presumption, not with God. God is updating his teaching to us always. And the thing is not to be too stuck in what the teaching was, but to attend to what the current lesson is. Wow. I didn't expect that to come. Hmm. I like that. <laughs> what do you think? Do you like that? Did you know the past is very important? the lessons we've had in the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, but we're saying the fifth year. And it's these lessons that are crucially important now. And sure, we need to have learnt the previous lessons. They've had input into what we're doing now, but we're not going back to relearn, you know, year two just a bit more thoroughly, unless we really feel you've missed something, in which case we'll not go back to it, we'll deal with it here and now in the present. Yes, that's how we teach, isn't it? So perhaps that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm not changing what you did in year one, two, three, and four, five, and six, but I am doing what we're doing now in year seven. And so it goes on. Well, I didn't teach on young ones very much. Oh, except, of course, I was a dad forever, bringing up three children quite separately in, in time. Hmm. And I, yeah, hey, I've taught um, the older kids. I've um, homeschooled my, one of my sons, younger. Um, I've lectured, of course, students. Um both what we might call sixth form or year, you know, the sort of, um, what is it, 16 to 18 year age range. And then of course I taught them at university. And at university of course we've got, well every age group in the end, because I mean, your staff are teaching each other, aren't they? I mean, we have seminars, we used to have seminars together and so on, staff seminars, teaching doing our research with each other. Yeah, experience quite a range of teaching. Call no man teacher though, all right? That's the Jesus statement. But in a worldly sense, I've been a teacher. Of course, I kid myself, I've been a good teacher. Hey, I like that phrase, I kid myself. What does a kid do? It's Steiner again. A kid is the master of fantasy and imagination. In other words, when I say I kid myself, I'm a good teacher, I'm saying in my imagination, I like to think of myself as a good teacher and hope that I am. Do you see? And without that basis, that ability to imagine, I think Steiner's contribution is if you miss that, if 
you miss the importance of the imagination, you stunt your future, you stunt the growth of your future. You can't imagine the good and work towards it in the full way you need to use your imagination to do so. You need to be blessed with an amazing imagination of people like C.S. Lewis and that, and, and John Bunyan um, have this extraordinary imagination, don't they? And I suspect people that have rewritten scripture have done the same thing too. And the scripture we have may be much rewritten, and I don't know. But anyway, scripture in large measure is a blessing unless you worship it. And then it becomes an incredible burden because it's not living in the way that God is. We should worship God. And who is God? God is your God. You can't worship any other. You can't worship my God. You have to worship your God, the one you've come to understand, the one you take as being God, which is the personification of all that you truly value, or believe you truly value in your heart. And as you follow that God, you will work out and find what is valid and what isn't. He'll show you the way. If you like the true God, whoever that is will show you the way. And your vision of the true God will unfold more and more beautifully and fully. And I believe that vision is very similar to the vision that others get through time in the end, too. That in some sense, it will lead to Rome. But Rome's unfortunate connotation here, but all roads lead to Rome. Our Christian view is not that. Christian religious view is that some parts will lead to hell. Well, not following what you understand to be God leads to hell, yes. Yeah. Or if your God is one of, well, you know, even if it's war and destruction. I don't know about Stalin, but I could say something about Hitler from the received historicity that we have. And that is he marries um, his um, partner before they suicide, according to the story, the historicity that we now have, which is the great desire to do what he understands to be good and right, something that he didn't feel he could do during his lifetime because it would have betrayed the people's vision of the Fuhrer as he saw it. Look, I'm not a Nazi, I'm not pro the atrocities, my goodness, how could I be? But I'm not dismissing this person because he's done what the world always understands to be evil. My name is Hope. And my hope is that he too, like Judas, will be an overcomer in the end. And you might think this is utter ridiculous stupidity and foolishness. Well, I mean this in the best possible way. You are most entitled to your view and you will live it out and I will live my view out, presumably until we find otherwise, if we ever do. We've seen evil people in the world, or people that, I don't like to say evil people actually, people that have been channels of great evil. 
But our God is greater, there's no question of that. And perhaps we're all in agreement on that. Our God is greater. Your God and my God is greater. We're not bewitched by the record of man or its historicity. We worship God. Our trust is in Him. I think that's what it's all about. What do you think? <laughs> I wish you could talk back to me. We'd have a good conversation, wouldn't we? And I'd try to shut up. <laughs> I'm not good at shutting up, man. I tried to listen. Sometimes I succeed. When I really love the person, I actually succeed. Until I think they're doing something that is wrecking their life, and then I can't shut up. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You see, really, the whole of this exercise, <laughs> if you like, all these recordings, are simply a way of saying, or illustrating, what it is to be led of God. Here I am, thinking it through. You're not giving much input to me, of course, only what I've surmised you might be hearing and thinking of. It's majorly influenced by what I'm thinking and what I'm trying to pick up of what God is teaching me. In other words, I'm endeavouring as me to be taught by the Holy Spirit. He that brings all things to my remembrance whatsoever Jesus said to me, if you like, the truth, the way, um, only what is heard of God. That's the ideal that I'm sort of, I think, attempting to personify the one being taught by the Spirit of God. So I'm delivering these recordings, trying to be as open and unaffected by you in a sense, but wanting to relate it to you. So I, I am trying to anticipate how you're, what you're making of this all the time. But I'm getting no feedback. Because, of course, you're not present to the actual recording. And if I do get feedback, well, then I add a note. Um, you know, if I think that's going to be helpful to do so. And the note may include all the feedback and so forth. But in some sense, I think the recording is worthwhile. Not in its content, yes, I hope, or it becomes meaningless. But majorly, in simply being, this is the way to be taught of the Holy Spirit, is to think things through with God. And if you voice it, in this case I'm not writing it, I'm recording it. If you voice it, if you record it in some way, it becomes example of the way, how to learn of the Spirit about God's way for you in your life. And of course, obviously, I'm doing that because my desire is that you be blessed accordingly. I'm also doing it because my desire is that it blesses me, and it does. And I accept the scripture in the sense that 
God does a greater thing in me than through me. He does a greater thing in you than through you. He is principally concerned with loving you in as far as, and in the way that, rather, he cares for you. So, we get someone like uh, Kriyananda, who, the fact that he's suddenly, you know, got an impl uh, uh, a member of his group who's a qualified and experienced accounting accountant, doesn't mean to say that he's going to use him as an accountant, because his spiritual life might need him to be doing the washing up, or teaching, you know, giving public talks for the organization. could be anything. Whatever's next step necessary in this member's development is what Kriyananda tries to do. Even though he needs an accountant, he's still not going to use you as the accountant because that's not what you need. What you need is experience perhaps in so-and-so. Do you see? And God is, how much more is God like that? What he allows you to do is not because God needs you as an accountant. He can produce an accountant out of thin air if he wants. What he's doing with you is what you need to be doing, is the ideal, isn't it? Since he's God and loves you, I mean, we have to assume that context, don't we? So I'm aware that these recordings are blessing me more than it's blessing you. But my motivation is, yeah, no, no, my motivation is to do that. It is to bless myself, of course. And uh, my blessing is also, perhaps I can only say also, in wanting to bless you as well. Of course. Of course, in as far as I can conceive that. But that has to be in my imagination. In fairness, even how it's blessing me has to be in my imagination. First. Or I won't do the recording. You know, if there's no imagined future, there's no hope of such future. If there's no hope of such future, I don't do anything towards it. Do you see? So in some sense it's necessary in the very plan. And dare I say it now, how much more with God? Let's pursue this for a moment. Yes, he's created the universe and he's created us for the love of us. But the greater motivation has been he had a need. And he conceived of how that need could be met. namely a situation in which he had a family from not having a family, a heavenly host from not having one to having one, which is probably by now infinitely vast anyway, but he's continuing the story perhaps. Do you see? And it's fulfilling a tremendous need he had, hence the tremendous creation. He didn't make it without purpose. He has a great desire to have this wonderful family, just as we do. Well, I think many of us do. Perhaps it's not in all of us a desire to have a wonderful family, but hmm, hmm. It certainly is in some of us, isn't it? Well, that's how I'm conceiving of him at the minute, anyway. And I think that's what I'm picking up from Jesus that his name is Father, our Heavenly Father, righteous, wonderful, wonderful Father. Mm. Okay, so, in some sense you understand where I think I'm coming from in doing these recordings. Bless you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Hey, Lord bless you and keep you. Lord cause his face, our Heavenly Father, 
to shine upon you and within you always. The Lord give you peace and joy and love and grace and wisdom and life eternal. All goodness bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And I'll add a note. May he give you that wonderful blessing of the habit of being thankful as continuously as is possible. For it seems to build you in the right direction. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Bless you. Thank you, Heavenly Father.